I would like to welcome everybody today and um, remind the students that we have a discussion with Ben after the talk is over and all the questions from the general audience have been asked. Um, to give you uh, an introduction here, uh, Ben received his um, undergraduate degrees in, I believe, psychology and anthropology at the University of, Sa of California, Santa Barbara. Um, he then obtained his master's and PhD from the University of Washington, and then did a postdoc back at um, Santa Barbara. So um, I would like to welcome him today for what I think will be a very interesting talk. Thanks. Well, thank you all so much for uh, taking time out of your busy social lives in order to uh, be here today. Um, so since it's a Zoom call, I obviously need to start by introducing my pets, as they will, I'm sure, feature prominently. So that's Widget and Frodo. Typically, we would then also, you know, spend 10 minutes discussing how we're all handling the pandemic, and then we'd have some uh, technical issues. But unfortunately, I have too many slides to do that today. So we'll just have to get started. So we are facing the silver tsunami. The U.S. Census Bureau predicts a 200% increase in adults age 85 by 2060. Currently, we are facing many issues related to uh, 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 cardiovascular disease and Alzheimer's disease. So cardiovascular disease causes about 800,000 deaths per year and currently is about $320 billion in direct costs. By 2030, it's estimated it'll be over $750 billion in direct costs per year. Alzheimer's dementia is the single most expensive disease an individual can get. Deaths have increased by about 30% over the last two decades. In 2017, it cost about $250 billion a year. By 2030, it'll be over a trillion in direct costs per year. And that's just the direct cost. That doesn't take into account all the time spent taking aging parents to the doctor or the 24-hour care required for many of these conditions. Now, in terms of chronic disease, we know that things like diet and physical activity are associated with cardiovascular disease. And we also know that in recent decades, there's been an increase in sedentary lifestyles. But in terms of human history, cities are really quite evolutionary novel. We spent more than 99% of human history as, uh, in small bands of hunter-gatherers. So the life we live in cities today is extremely novel. We currently have clean water, no parasites or pathogens, medication when sick, social support programs like Social Security and Medicare. None of that existed for most of human history. If you were to compress human, the last 5 million years of human history into a single year, we were hunter-gatherers on January 1st, February 1st, March, April, May, all the way until December 31st. And then at December 31st at 11.40 p.m., that's when the Industrial Revolution occurred. What this means is that natural selection optimized our physiology under a very different set of environmental conditions than the ones that we live in today. So uh, if I want to eat meat for dinner, I can get in my car, I can drive to McDonald's, and I can hunt and gather 2,000 calories. I don't even have to get out of my car. I had to take five steps out to the driveway. During my dissertation research, I followed Shimane hunters, and the average hunt lasted 8.6 hours and covered a little over 11 miles. Even then, it was only about 60% success rate which means that that'd be like walking 5.5 miles to the grocery store and finding out that there's no meat. Now we know that the exposures that humans uh, have faced uh, over uh, th throughout most of human evolution have changed quite a bit. So we face many novel challenges nowadays like ozone, cigarette smoke, diesel smoke, uh, industrial coal. All of these are relatively novel exposures compared to most of human history. But when you're thinking about chronic diseases of aging, how could you ever study something like Alzheimer's uh, or heart disease in populations that um, uh, are living a traditional lifestyle? Because did people even live long enough? Wasn't life nasty, brutish, and short? Well, there is good evidence that the life expectancy at birth for uh, the average hunter-gatherer is about 32 years. So you might say like, okay, well then that's never gonna be a problem. Uh, something like Alzheimer's disease, that would never have occurred throughout human evolution, evolutionary past. But that's actually not true. So life expectancy at birth is not a good measure of longevity. It's heavily skewed by infant mortality. So if you have a population where the average person dies at age 80, but there also is 20% infant mortality, then that drastically draws down the, uh, the overall life expectancy at birth of that population. A much better measure is actually modal age of death. 
And so if you look across all uh, extant um, hunter-gatherer and forager horticultural population, the modal age at death, so the average age at which people die, the most common age at which people die who make it to age 15 is somewhere between 65 and 75. So people are living long enough to uh, develop chronic diseases of aging. However, almost all medical research is conducted in industrialized urban environments. So we don't actually know all that much about uh, what chronic disease was like in subsistence populations living traditional lifestyles. So today, we're going to talk about three of the most common and costly diseases of aging. So heart disease, the number one killer in America today, benign prosthetic hyperplasia, uh, an inevitable part of male aging in the US, and Alzheimer's dementia, the single most expensive disease an individual can get in their lifetime. Much of the research I'm going to be talking about today uh, is conducted among the Chimane. The Chimane are forager horticulturalists in the Bolivian Amazon. Until very recently, they have had no electricity and no communities have running water. Only a few communities have intermittent uh, electrical uh, access. The subsistence population, so slash and burn horticulture, hunting, fishing, about two thirds of calories come from uh, horticulture, about 17% of calories come from hunting, 7% uh, from fishing, and two to five from market goods. There's relatively wide variation in relatively low levels of acculturation, market integration, Spanish speaking ability, and access to medical care. Um, men, for example, average about 4.5 hours more physical activity per day than U.S. males and uh, burn about 850 calories more per day. Now, all the work that I'm going to talk about today um, is conducted by a large group of individuals. This wouldn't be possible without um, a huge team uh, directed by Mike Gervin, Ilya Kaplan, John Stieglitz, and myself. Um, we have a very large American team. We also have a very large uh, team of Bolivian uh, Chimane anthropologists and also um, uh, medical doctors who are uh, locally trained in Bolivia. Recently, we've begun collaborating with a number of cardiologists, uh, radiologists, and neurogerontologists. And what do cardiologists eat when they get together? Kentucky Fried Chicken. So the Chimane are uh, a population of about 16,000 individuals spread across 85 communities. They range in size from about 30 to 500 individuals. The total fertility rate is about 9.1 um, children per woman with a doubling time of about 18 years. Most of the communities are along the Maniki River. Um, and uh, uh, these communities, like I said, range in size from about 30 to 500 individuals. Um, uh, here's a woman making chicha. So almost all of the um, uh, foods and beverages eaten are uh, collected and produced in the home. As I said, with no running water, um, uh, people uh, use the stream and river, and this leads to a relatively high rate of giardia and other helmets. There's lots of fishing. Hunting makes up an important part of the diet. Um, again, the largest proportion of calories come from uh, small-scale horticulture. So men will go out and clear large areas of the forest. And then once they have those areas cleared, they will then um, burn them off. And that releases enough carbon and nitrogen into the soil. There's a very, very little topsoil in the jungle. And then after that um, uh, uh, carbon and nitrogen has been released into the soil, then it's possible to grow crops like planioc, mantain, corn, and rice. Uh, hunting, again, makes up a very important part of the diet. Um, and an important part of social life, um, fish as well. Now, like I said, um, most medical research is conducted in urban industrialized environments. And so we don't really know that much about what chronic disease is like in subsistence populations living a traditional lifestyle. So today we're gonna to focus in on um, the three um, deadly, common, and costly um, diseases of aging. So let's start off with cardiovascular disease. Uh, probably everybody in this audience knows that modifiable risk factors like diet and exercise are associated with cardiovascular disease risk. Well, populations like the Chimane have low levels of lipids, high levels of physical activity, but what about something like cardiovascular disease? Well, it's actually pretty hard to measure cardiovascular disease um, uh, in most populations. In fact, in the US, most people don't know they have cardiovascular disease until they have a heart attack. You can have high blood pressure, you can have high lipids. It's associated with cardiovascular disease, but it doesn't guarantee that you have it. And so 
most people, like I said, don't know until they have their first heart attack unless they've had, say, an angiogram or a gated coronary CT scan. So let's talk about some of the risk factors. So the Shimano don't have the Atkins diet. 72% of calories come from carbohydrates. So this isn't the quote unquote paleo diet, which obviously doesn't exist for many reasons. Um, about 16% of calories come from uh, proteins, which is the same as we see in the US. But Shimano have a much lower proportion of the diet that comes from fats and in particular saturated fats. So whereas 34% of the US diet comes from uh, fats, uh, only about 14% of the Chimane diet comes from fats. And again, the fats that Chimane are consuming are largely from relatively lean um, prey animals and fish and not um, trans fats or other saturated fats from potato chips. If you look at body fat, the mean body fat for uh, Chimane men aged 45 to 90 is around um, uh, 17%. Uh, in the US, the average is about 30%. And in fact, only about 3% of US males have body fat that falls below the Chimane median. So Chimane have much lower levels of body fat. Chimane are also much more active. So in the US, uh, my cardiology colleagues uh, all recommend that their patients get 10,000 steps per day. Um, Chimane average about 16,000 steps per day. Unfortunately, while it's suggested that um, we get around 10,000 steps per day in the US, uh, the average uh, person in the US only gets about 5,100 steps per day. Uh, another modifiable risk factor, something like hypertension, uh, we see relatively low rates of hypertension among the Chimane. So um, some of the lowest levels of hypertension ever seen. And I added an asterisk because note that those are the old guidelines. So the guidelines have recently changed. This would actually um, more likely increase all of the um, US and industrialized populations and have minimal effect on the Shimane. Additionally, we do see some white coat hypertension. And so we see um, even lower levels of uh, blood pressures among the Shimane with repeat measures. And you can imagine if you only see a doctor once or twice in your lifetime that um, that could cause an increase in blood pressure. Additionally, we see very low age-related uh, increases in uh, blood pressure. So if you compare across standard cardiovascular disease risk factors, so obesity, hypertension, cholesterol, low-density cholesterol, glucose, Chimane are better off on all measures. So only about 6% of Chimane are obese, whereas 40% of Americans are obese. Uh, again, old guidelines for hypertension, only 5% of Chimane showed uh, any evidence of hypertension, whereas a third of Americans do. Uh, we have uh, no evidence of any Chimane uh, over 240 milligrams uh, per deciliter of total cholesterol, whereas about 11% of Americans uh, have high cholesterol. And then in terms of low density lipoproteins or bad cholesterol, uh, about 10% of Chimane have slightly elevated uh, low density lipoproteins, but about 40% of Americans do. We've only seen one or two cases of um, uh, individuals with diabetes among the Chimane whereas about 10% of Americans um, have glucose higher than 125 grams per deciliter. That said, Chimane do have two major risk factors. So first, inflammation is thought to play causal roles in every aspect of coronary artery disease, from the beginning of plaque formation up through myocardial infarction. And 48% of Chimane have elevated C-reactive protein. So relatively high levels of inflammation could be putting them at additional risk. Additionally, Chimane have relatively low levels of high density lipoproteins or good cholesterol. And so uh, my doctor, uh, he always recommends that um, find some way to raise my uh, high density lipoproteins. That said, about 60% of Chimane have very low levels of HDL below the clinical cutoff. So while there are many uh, positive um, uh, risk factors among the Chimane, suggesting that they would have low cardiovascular uh, coronary artery calcium, uh, there are still these two major risk factors. Okay, so um, how you, we can look at all these risk factors, but if it's difficult to measure um, actual levels of heart disease, how are we gonna do that? Well, luckily there are some new non-invasive measures uh, that are very sensitive and specific uh, for looking at actual levels of calcium inside the coronary artery. So this is a CT scan of, um, uh, it's a textbook image of um, uh, a individual with high level of calcium in their heart. 
So if you look um, the white images that you see here, I actually don't know if you see my mouse, but that's the spine, that's the sternum, and then the ribs are coming out here. And uh, so in this individual, this is the heart tissue, and then these are the two lobes of the lungs. Um, if you see any white, that means that there's calcium in that space. And if there's calcium in the coronary arteries, then that means that individual has heart disease. And so uh, this makes it possible to non-invasively measure actual calcification in the arteries of living people. Um, and like I said, it's got a very high sensitivity and specificity. Okay, but we're in the middle of the Bolivian Amazon. So how are we going to uh, look at this? Well, the Chimani Health and Life History Project motto uh, has always been that all methods are field-friendly if you want to know the answer badly enough. And so uh, about six hours away in the regional capital of Trinidad, uh, we came across a broken CT machine that had been donated by the French government. Um, unfortunately, the technicians had not been um, uh, uh, trained to US standards. And so they had just been cranking up the radiation whenever an image didn't come out um, uh, as clear as they would like. And so we ended up um, bringing in techs from GE and bringing in um, American trained um, uh, CT techs to uh, first fix the machine and then uh, train individuals in local hospital how to accurately use the machine. Then we brought individuals from the, um, uh, the Chimane communities. We bring them first uh, to our uh, local clinic in the nearby town of San Borja. And then from there, we do a full medical workup and then we contact the social worker at the hospital in Trinidad we get everyone entered in the Bolivian medical system, and then we uh, set up all of the different um, appointments of specialists they need. So if you're a 6 year old Chimane man, chances are the only doctor you've ever seen is our project doctor. And you've probably never been to an actual hospital or seen a high level of care. And that means that over time, you've racked up a number of things that require specialty appointments. So cataracts, pterygian, um, uh, with such high number of births, we see high rates of cystocele in women. Um, among men, we see very high rates of hernias. And so what we can do is we can contact ahead the hospital and set up appointments for all those individuals. And then we rent buses and we take people um, on the six hour drive to the capital. And then we um, rent rooms for everyone and we bring in cooks. And then we have people go through and they do their uh, CT appointment where they get a gated coronary CT scan and a, a brain CT as well. And then we, um, they go through and they do all their different specialty appointments. And additionally, um, in Bolivia, you can use a, um, a CT scan to diagnose tuberculosis. So if you see an open uh, cavitation in the lung that's uh, half filled with fluid, then that suggests that that individual does have active TB. Um, we can't use that in the US, but in Bolivia, that is acceptable. And so we can actually use that data to then help diagnose uh, rates of TB. So it's a um, a win-win situation where uh, Chimane get high levels of care they wouldn't normally be able to get, and we also um, collect some really interesting data. Uh, additionally, I should say that a uh, gated coronary CT scan is the equivalent of uh, radiation of being alive for three weeks, so this is not um, uh, a major radiation issue at all. And all of the CT images that you'll see from this point are my brain and chest. I'd never do a study that I was not willing to be a part of. So um, the data I'm going to show today are from seven, uh, 705 individuals. Um, we've since increased that to about 1,260 individuals. Um, we now, I believe, have 62 individuals in the entire population that have not been imaged that are over the age of 60. So it's almost a complete population sample. Um, the, we do a fasting morning blood draw in our clinic. We have extensive behavioral data collection, things like accelerometry, diet, um, production sharing, depression, cognitive interviews. They do a complete medical exam um, with an MD-PhD uh, with ICD-10 diagnosis. We do an electrocardiogram and uh, heart echocardio uh, echocardiography. So one of the things is that, um, uh, let's say I was about to show you data showing that Chimane weren't having uh, any cardiovascular disease. That's what I'm about to show you. But one of the things you might say is, well, if somebody had a heart attack and then died, then um, they wouldn't be in your sample. Well, 
we did 350 verbal autopsies. So essentially all of the individuals in the last um, five to 10 years that have, uh, that have died um, who are over the age of 60, and only one of those was potentially consistent with myocardial infarction. We saw zero episodes of wall motion defects uh, in our uh, echocardiography, and that suggests that individuals um, were not having a prior heart attack. Um, and then, like I said, we do giddy coronary CT scan and then a brain CT. So the data I'm going to show now are from uh, US white males from the multi-ethnic study of atherosclerosis. And so uh, if you look at this graph here, um, if an individual has a coronary artery calcium score of one, they have cardiovascular disease. If you have a score of zero, you have no cardiovascular disease. Um, what this is showing is that the median US male by age 75 to 84 uh, has a coronary calcium score of around 400. And that's a rather extreme level of coronary artery calcium. If you have a coronary artery calcium score over 100, that's considered clinically severe disease, and you should be on statins and seeing a cardiologist every six months. So the average US male um, by around age 80 has a coronary artery calcium score of 400. That is not the case for the Chimani. The average Chimani age uh, uh, 75 to 85 has a coronary artery calcium score of zero. And it's not just the men. We see the same thing in women. Note, however, that the axes are about to go down significantly. Women uh, in the U.S. and worldwide have lower levels of coronary artery calcium than men. So if you look at um, uh, U.S. white women from, again, the multi-ethnic uh, study of atherosclerosis, we see that the average um, U.S., the median U.S. woman by around age 80 has a coronary artery calcium score of 100. And again, the median Chimani woman, uh, age 75 to 85, has a coronary artery calcium score of zero. So overall, about 15.5% of Chimani presented with any coronary artery calcium, whereas 86% of US adults uh, over the age of 40 have coronary artery calcium. Only 2.8% of Chimani have high coronary artery calcium, so over 100 Agatson units, which is a level at which you should see a cardiologist, whereas 50% of individuals in the US have clinically high coronary artery calcium. Now, it's not just compared to Americans. So if we look worldwide, um, Chimane have the lowest levels of coronary artery calcium uh, across all age ranges, both for men and for women. Now, we do see, however, some age-related changes in coronary artery calcium. So if you look at the... Uh, uh, number of individuals who have a coronary calcium score of zero, uh, it declines with age among Chimane from 100% uh, having no coronary calcium to only 65% of those in their 80s having zero coronary calcium. And we see slight increases in the amount of coronary calcium uh, uh, levels over 100 with age. However, this is nothing compared to what we see in the US. Additionally, on top of just levels of coronary artery calcium, clinical cardiac function is very well preserved among the Chimane. So we only know of uh, one case of um, atrial fibrillation. Um, we've done, um, I think, over uh, 1,100. Actually, now it's closer to 1,500 um, electrocardiograms on individuals age 40 plus. We see very robust um, uh, VO2 max and heart rate recovery. Systolic and diastolic function are very well preserved. If you look at ejection fraction, we're seeing excellent ejection fraction. Um, ejection fraction's obviously been in the news a lot lately because it's one of the things that they're looking for uh, in COVID patients. So compared though to st the standard risk factors, Chimani did have high levels of HDL, or sorry, um, the Chimani have very low levels of HDL, which is normally a risk factor. And oddly enough, Chimani with higher HDL had significantly higher rates of coronary artery calcium. Additionally, despite having relatively high levels of C-reactive protein, there's very little coronary artery calcium in this population. Now, one thing to note is that there's a relatively high rate of both um, things like respiratory infections and tuberculosis, but also parasite and pathogen load. So 70% of adults have helmets at any given time, and 30% have Giardia. And there are a number of ways in which this could impact cardiovascular function or uh, lipid metabolism throughout the body. And so won't go into too much detail, but um, uh, ultracrophages in inhibit um, uh, your ability to put on, on body fat. 
they downregulate some inflammatory processes, and they increase insulin sensitivity. Helminths themselves cannot pr produce their own lipids, so they consume lipids either directly from the food that we eat. So think of like a tapeworm. They're eating your fats before you get a chance to eat them. Um, uh, or they're eating them from our bloodstream. So hookworm buries into the intestinal wall and then pulls lipids out of our bloodstream. Um, as you have uh, high levels of immune activation, you see increased uh, resting metabolic rate. Um, additionally, for most of us in this audience, probably about 10% of our white blood cells are monocytes. Monocytes are kind of like the hall monitors. They're floating around looking for anything out of place. And if they happen to come across a low density lipoprotein that's passing through the lumen of the artery uh, in the heart, they'll, they know that it shouldn't be there. And so they'll attach onto it and they'll calcify it. And that can begin to be the beginning of a foam cell formation. Um, for the Chimane, less than 1% of the white blood cells are monocytes. And that's because as soon as they produce monocytes, they're immediately recruited to fight something real. Um, additionally, uh, TH2 biased immunity increases uh, alternatively active macrophages, it has anti-inflammatory processes, and adjusts T regulatory cells. Um, we do find that individuals who have higher levels of eosinophils, ha which is uh, the white blood cell subtype that specifically targets um, uh, large parasites, have lower BMI, lower total cholesterol, uh, uh, lower LDL, HDL, triglycerides, and lower overall uh, blood glucose. And we actually have a number of cases where we've treated an individual with antiparasitics. So our mobile medical team goes from community to community, and individuals come in in the morning um, uh, for an appointment. They do a fasting morning blood draw. As the patients are eating breakfast, our biochemist goes ahead and does a complete blood count, uh, does a fecal smear analysis, a urinalysis, passes that information to our team doctor. Patients then see the doctor for a complete workup. And if that patient um, uh, has, say, parasites in their stool, then the doctor will provide uh, uh, albendazole because that's the standard of care. Interestingly, there have been a number of cases where we've seen individuals who uh, had parasites and they were treated. And what we find is that deworming treatment causes an increase in um, uh, BMI, an increase in total cholesterol, an increase in LDL, HDL, triglycerides, and an increase in blood glucose following treatment. So once we get rid of those parasites, then all of a sudden their um, uh, blood chemistry starts to look a little bit more American. So is there a smoking gun? Not really. There almost never is. So we know that Chimane are much more physically active, more steps per day, less time sedentary, say like sitting, giving lectures, minimal tobacco smoking, uh, low levels of saturated fats, almost no trans fats or, or processed food, um, but also less uh, exposure to some types of air pollution. So um, they aren't living uh, alongside major freeways. Um, they aren't uh, living in major cities where they're getting exposed to um, all sorts of uh, air pollution, although they do get exposed to lots of wood smoke. Um, and also they have chronic parasitic infection. And overall, these are associated with, um, in total, uh, a low lifetime, uh, low density lipoprotein, um, relatively low blood pressure, excellent fasting blood glucose, and a relatively low BMI. And so all in all, these factors together combine to create a situation where there's minimal coronary calcium deposition throughout life. Now, what we're working on now, or what we were before COVID, was um, trying to decompose these factors to figure out what are the most critical factors involved in coronary calcium deposition. Is it um, that if you were to just adjust diet, that would be enough? Or if you were just to adjust physical activity, would that be enough? Um, but we don't know the answer to that yet. We're still working on it. Now, like I said before, most medical research is conducted in industrialized environments. And we know very little in subsistence populations. So we talked about the most deadly. Now let's talk about one of the most common, benign prosthetic hyperplasia. And you might think like, okay, but it only affects like half the population. How can it be that important or really worth talking about? Well, it's considered an inevitable aspect of male aging. Um, doctors uh, oftentimes don't even ask older men if they get up during the night to use the restroom because there's no point in asking because they know it'll happen to almost all men. So 90% of their men Men in the 80s will have experienced prostate enlargement. 
and about 40% of men in the US uh, require medical treatment for benign prosthetic hyperplasia in their lifetime. In 2010, benign prosthetic hyperplasia was the 12th largest contributor to disability adjusted life years. It actually made more of an impact on, uh, this is despite impacting only males, it made more uh, of an impact in terms of disability adjusted life years than epilepsy and Parkinson's combined. Now, when I say it's essentially inevitable, what I mean is that it's essentially inevitable. Um, males in industrialized populations who live long enough will develop uh, benign prosthetic hyperplasia or an enlarged prostate. And it's pretty well established that in um, human and animal models that obesity and metabolic syndrome uh, increase the risk of benign prosthetic hyperplasia. Another big risk factor though is testosterone. So having low testosterone is associated with many um, uh, potentially negative health outcomes from cognitive performance to obesity and heart disease. Um, but there's very good evidence from randomized controlled trials that testosterone plays really important roles in prostate health. So as soon as men begin to uh, experience uh, clinically relevant prostate enlargement, aromatase inhibitors like finasteride are the first drug of choice. Those prevent testosterone from aromatizing into more potent androgens. Um, and in doing so, they slow prostate growth. As long as the prostate keeps getting exposed to testosterone, it's going to keep growing. Well, what about other populations? Do they have the same levels of testosterone? Well, as it turns out, testosterone is really con uh, tightly constrained by your ener energetic availability. So about 20% of male basal metabolic rate, so just me sitting here doing nothing, being alive, uh, about 20% of my energy is going to just maintain my, my muscle mass. And so as soon as males engage in um, uh, or enter into any sort of situation where they're going to have an energetic shortfall, one of the first things to go is testosterone because no sense in investing in uh, muscle mass to help with reproduction later when instead you should focus on just staying alive. And so if we look at um, luteinizing hormone secretion in a rhesus macaque, um, this stimulates testosterone production. If you were to look at um, the same measurement in testosterone, it would be the same thing just shifted 30 minutes to the right. So on a normal day, um, uh, recent cacs get 30, tech, 30 pellets of Teclad, and then you see a number of spikes in luteinizing hormone overnight, and those would be followed by spikes in testosterone. If you don't feed them, you see an immediate decline in the frequency and amplitude of those pulses. And this means that testosterone has now decreased dramatically. And then as soon as you refeed them, they uh, almost immediately return to uh, normal homeostatic levels of both luteinizing hormone and testosterone. Well, same holds true for humans. Men who fast for greater than 48 hours show castrate levels of testosterone. Um, I convinced students at the University of Washington to just miss dinner, and that resulted in a 10% decline in morning testosterone. And in fact, there's good evidence that during any energetic stress, testosterone is almost immediately downregulated. So um, men who get a flu shot, you see about a 10 to 14% decrease in testosterone as their body shifts energetic resources to produce antibodies, um, reduce energy intake from um, dieting or from uh, fasting, also increased energetic expenditure. So for uh, U.S. Army Ranger training, uh, typically by day two of their intensive skills week, they see almost castrate levels of testosterone because they're on average burning 6,000 calories a day and eating less than 1,000. So for all of these um, reasons combined, if you think about an industrialized population, we would have, for most of human history, we would have had relatively high parasite and pathogen loads, uh, low food security, and high levels of energetic expenditure. So we might expect to see slightly lower levels of testosterone in subsistence populations. Well, in industrialized populations, we see a spike in testosterone in the early 20s, and then a slow decline of about 1% to 3% per year. And it doesn't really matter whether which industrialized population you're looking at, whether you're looking cross-sectionally or longitudinally. Um, this is a fairly standard profile. And this has actually led to an increase in um, uh, uh, a direct-to-consumer advertising for testosterone. So you've probably all seen ads where it says, like, uh, do you have low energy? It's usually a silver fox doing something vaguely active, um, but looking, you know, reticent and sad. You know, if you feel fatigued or irritable, or if you had low libido or trouble sleeping, could well be low testosterone. And so luckily, you know, you can take these online quizzes that tell you if you have low testosterone or not, 
um, completely makes my lab obsolete. But um, actually the real problem here is that um, sedentary lifestyle and obesity contribute to age-related changes in testosterone. So anytime testosterone interacts with adipose tissue, it aromatizes into estradiol. And the male hypothalamus doesn't differentiate between testosterone and estradiol. They're chemically almost identical. Men have relatively low levels of estradiol. There's no, need, no reason to need, have a need to differentiate. Um, and so uh, what, um, what we see is that um, as men put on additional body fat, then testosterone is converting into estradiol. And as that um, estradiol level is increasing, then testosterone is no longer being produced. The hypothalamus says, oh, we got plenty of testosterone already. And in men, when you start to see a higher ratio of estradiol to testosterone, then it becomes much easier to put on abdominal body fat. And this creates kind of a downward spiral where as men become uh, more obese, then testosterone's lower, and then it's harder to maintain their muscle mass, and then it's easier to put on more body fat. And so you get this kind of downward spiral. We actually see the exact opposite in men who get um, uh, uh, procedures to uh, like gastric bypass. So within a year of gastric bypass, testosterone uh, on average goes up 30% because as fat is uh, being eliminated, then you start to get a higher ratio of testosterone to estradiol. And then it's easier to put on more muscle fat or more muscle mass and uh, muscle itself is uh, catabolic. So it's burning energy and burning fat. However, in subsistence populations where you have to be physically active in order to be able to um, uh, uh, even just eat, uh, we might not see the same thing. And in fact, we don't. We see minimal cross-sectional age-related changes in uh, testosterone among the Chimane. Um, again, in the US, we see this big peak in the early 20s and then a steady decline throughout age. But among the Chimane, they have uh, actually to begin with relatively low levels of testosterone and then very little change in testosterone with age. So Chimane on average have about 37% lower levels of testosterone than age-matched US males. And indeed, um, uh, not just among the Chimane, but we see the same pattern uh, uh, all around the world with higher levels of testosterone in industrial populations, and then levels that are about 20 to 60% lower in subsistence populations. Um, say that I don't think that it's that um, Chimane and these other populations have low levels of testosterone. I think it's that individuals living in industrialized populations have ridiculously high levels of testosterone that are evolutionarily novel. And this has important implications for things like benign prosthetic hyperplasia. So for the Chimane, with relatively low levels of androgens, low levels of obesity, low levels of metabolic syndrome, um, we'd actually hypothesized a reduced rate of benign prosthetic hyperplasia. Okay, but how do you measure benign prosthetic hyperplasia? Well, again, all methods are field friendly if you want to know the answer badly enough. And so we did abdominal ultrasounds on about 350 Chimane males aged 40 to 80. Uh, it's much more pleasant than the digital rectal exam, and we really want to keep working with the Chimane. So we stuck with the abdominal ultrasound. We did fasting morning blood draws, um, uh, and we took point of care glycosylated hemoglobin. And then in the lab, I analyzed testosterone, prostate specific antigen, and sex hormone binding globulin. And if you look at um, prostate volume by age in industrialized populations, um, the average male by age 45 in the US has a prostate volume greater than 20 cubic centimeters, which is the anatomical cutoff for benign prosthetic hyperplasia. So the average male in the US by age 45 already has benign prosthetic hyperplasia. And again, once you get to around 40 cubic centimeters, that's when things start getting really bad. Among the Chimane, this is not the case with low levels of androgens and um, low levels of obesity, we see relatively minimal age-related changes in testosterone with age-related age changes in prostate volume and uh, overall relatively low. And even if you were to scale this to height, so Chimane on average, the average Chimane male is about five foot two. Um, and so even if you were to scale, most organs scale to height, if you were to scale the prostate, um, they would still be uh, below um, the levels that you see here. The average Shimane prostate is about 13 cubic centimeters smaller. Um, that may not sound like all that much, but uh, that's actually about the size of a K-cup for coffee. Um, so that's a pretty big deal when that's crushing your urethra and your bladder. Compared to um, age-standardized uh, US males, uh, Shimane prostates are six 
62% smaller. But really importantly, like I said, about 40% of cases in the US will require medical intervention. Um, and that's when you get to about 40 cubic centimeters. Uh, that's nice. Less than 1% of uh, individuals had uh, advanced benign prosthetic hyperplasia, whereas 50% of US males have these large prostates that need treatment. And this actually has important implications for what's normal. Uh, if some of the inevitable aspects of male aging um, aren't inevitable in all populations, then that means that we could do something to uh, modify behavior or lifestyle to potentially avoid these issues. Okay, so we talked about the most deadly, we talked about one of the most common. Now let's talk about the most costly. So Alzheimer's disease is the most uh, common form of dementia. It's a degenerative brain disease. It's the single uh, most expensive disease a person can get. And again, these costs are all direct costs. So that's like the cost of hospital care or of the actual billing of a doctor. That doesn't count any of the indirect costs um, for caring for a parent at home or for um, driving them back and forth to um, uh, different appointments. We're seeing huge rises in Alzheimer's cases um, over the last decade. Uh, so we're expected to see somewhere between a 40 and 70% increase in Alzheimer's cases between 2016 and 2025 uh, in Arizona, for example. Despite all of this, the etiology of Alzheimer's is poorly understood. Now, what we do know is that there's uh, one single strong genetic risk factor for Alzheimer's disease, and that's the apolipoprotein E4 allele raises the risk for Alzheimer's compared to non-carriers. Uh, Among females who are homozygous for the APOE4 allele, there's approximately a 90% chance of developing Alzheimer's by age 80. Additionally, in the US, individuals that have the APOE4 allele have faster cognitive decline compared to non-carriers and higher cholesterol and increased cardiovascular disease risk. So overall, in the US, having the APOE4 allele has a lot of negatives. Interestingly, the distribution of APOE4 um, is uh, first at relatively high rates, where overall about 14% of individuals have this allele that has all these deleterious effects in our current environment. Um, but interestingly, it's significantly more common in the tropics. So hot, wet environments have much higher um, uh, rates of individuals carrying the APOE4 allele than uh, colder or drier climates. Now, we actually see the same um, uh, uh, a similar graph if we were to look, look at, say, helminths. So tropics are known for their biodiversity, but that pathogens. And we see uh, relatively high rates of helminths in hot tropical regions. Now, are there any benefits to APOE4 allele? Well, as it turns out, there are a couple of potentially pr uh, protective um, effects for um, uh, APOE4 against some infections. So in humans, there's some evidence that um, you can spontaneously clear hepatitis uh, C and Giardia if you have the APOE4 allele. And in mouse models, uh, there's some evidence that um, uh, mouse models with APOE4 allele can uh, spontaneously clear cryptosporidium. Now, all of that said, mouse models are obviously not ideal because they don't have the APOE4 allele. And so these are transgenic mouse models and mice are very different from humans. Um, there is good evidence, however, uh, additionally, that individuals with the APOE4 allele are better able to absorb cholesterol uh, from dietary sources. Now, again, that means that if I eat a hamburger and I have the APOE4 allele, then I absorb more cholesterol than someone who doesn't. So that sounds bad in our current environment. But if you're in a high parasite environment, then that might help you offset some of the metabolic costs of a high parasite load. It also would provide more calories that would help you increase the odds potentially of clearing those infections. Now, parasites and pathogens, there's good evidence that they negatively impact cognitive performance. So if you're shifting resources towards immune function instead of cognitive function, or say like brain development in children, then uh, you see uh, some real negative impacts. Uh, in a number of sub uh, studies in sub-Saharan Africa, there are randomized controlled trials showing that treating for helmets improves cognitive function and school grades in infected children. And if you just look at um, rates of log infectious disease, you see lower cognitive performance in higher areas of infectious disease. 
Now, there have been two studies on um, the ApoE4 allele parasites and child cognitive performance. The first was in Brazilian, Brazilian favelas with a high burden of giardia, and they found that uh, children with the ApoE4 allele had um, better cognitive performance and grew faster. In Mexico City, in a multi-stressor environment um, that had high parasite and pathogen load, but also um, uh, lead exposure and a couple of other things, they found that children with the ApoE4 allele had better child performance. But to date, nobody looked at um, whether the ApoE4 allele could be beneficial for adults facing um, high parasite and pathogen load. So now when it comes to measuring parasites and what an, a person's individual parasite load is, um, there are a couple of different ways you can do it. And there are some advantages and disadvantages to different ways that you can measure things. Um, if I was to just take a fecal sample from an individual today, then if I saw a bunch of eggs or a bunch of parasites there, then that would be evidence that they were infected. However, an individual could, be, could have a relatively high uh, infectious burden, but if those parasites were at a different life stage where they weren't producing eggs or where they were all still growing, then I might not see any uh, in a fecal sample. And so another way that you can do this would be to look at the levels of eosinophils. So there are five white blood cell subtypes, and eosinophils are the subtype that fight parasites. If you look among the Chimane, um, about 20% of Chimane white blood cells uh, are eosinophils, whereas less than 3% of, uh, or about 3% of U.S. blood cells, are, white blood cells, are eosinophils. The U.S. reference range for eosinophils is 157 cells per microliter. The average Chimane has um, 1,528 eosinophils per microliter. So they have much more extreme levels of eosinophilia than we have. About 85% of adults are in what would be clinical eosinophilia and require treatment by U.S. standards. So what we did was we wanted to see, do individuals who are experiencing a high parasite load, um, is there potentially any benefit to the ApoE4 allele for those individuals? And so um, in this particular population, around 24% of individuals have at least one copy of the ApoE4 allele. So um, there are only two alleles present in this population, uh, ApoE3 and ApoE4. In the US and other populations, we also have the ApoE2 allele, um, but that's not present in this population. So we used um, a cognitive uh, battery based on the Mexican Health and Aging Study, which is designed uh, for non-literate populations. And this contains a number of different um, aspects of cognitive performance. So short and long-term recall, a digit forward task where I um, repeat a growing and growing series of numbers until failure. Um, category fluency, which is like name all the animals in the forest, name all the fish in the river. And then a visual scan task, which is somewhat akin to Where's Waldo, where there's an array of images on a, on a sheet of paper, and then you have to go through and highlight only one of those specific images whenever it appears throughout. So what I'm going to do now is um, show you a series of results. So this first result is what we'd expect in any industrialized population and what um, there's good data on from uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. And that's that um, your uh, predicted um, uh, cognitive performance is uh, impacted by your level of parasite. So if you look on the bottom, an individual that has zero eosinophils likely has very low levels of parasite load. An individual who has very high eosinophil counts uh, likely has a very high parasite pathogen load. So for individuals that uh, just have the E3 allele, this is exactly what we'd expect. More parasites, poor cognitive performance. Been shown over and over again around the world. That's not the case though for individuals who carry the E4 allele. They're actually able to maintain cognitive performance even at very high levels of parasite load. And in fact, this is what we see in uh, nearly every case. So whether you're looking at short and long-term recall, individuals have, um, poor cognitive performance when they have higher parasite loads, if they have the E3 allele, if they have the E4 allele, then they actually um, show uh, they're able to maintain, if not have enhanced cognitive performance. Again, category fluency, exactly the same, the digit forward tasks. In fact, this is what we see in every single task. E4 consistently had beneficial impacts on cognitive performances in cases of very high eosinophil counts. Now, in the US, uh, individuals who have the ApoE4 allele have poor cognitive performance. 
And if we were to look at the US reference levels, we actually see the same thing. So individuals with APOE3 allele outperform individuals with APOE4 allele when there are no parasites present. Um, so in the normal US reference range, um, we consistently see the exact same effect in the US as we see among the Chimane. But with high parasite loads that would have been common throughout most of human, uh, human evolutionary past, then there may be some advantages to the APOE4 allele. So APOE4 allele carriers are better able to maintain cognitive performance um, with high uh, parasite burden. And among non-carriers, higher eosinophil counts are associated with poor cognitive performance on all measures. Now it's important to note that uh, cognitive function is critical for the human ecological niche. So parasite burden negatively impacts cognitive performance. Uh, parasites are a common source of morbidity throughout human evolution. So there could potentially be a selective advantage for those able to um, minimize the negative impacts of parasite burden. And interestingly enough, um, some work with my uh, grad student Mia Sharifson and postdoc Angela Garcia um, show that women who have, um, for 500 women who have completed uh, fertility, individuals who have the APOE4 allele actually have higher fertility. You average about one additional child for one copy and three additional children for two copies. And I should note that this is the exact same effect size that was noted by Van Excel and colleagues in the Gambia, um, but with a slightly smaller sample size in their sample. Now, how are they getting more children? Well, we see an earlier age at first reproduction. So women who have two copies of the APOE4 allele are reproducing significantly earlier. And we also see shorter interbirth intervals for uh, individuals uh, who have the APOE4 allele. So what about Alzheimer's disease? Um, if individual that we have high rates of the APOE4 allele, then do we potentially also see high rates of Alzheimer's? So you have to rule out B12 deficiency, uh, traumatic brain injury, stroke, thyroid, depression, cognitive decline, vascular dementia. So typically what's done in the US is you, if a patient uh, is thought to have Alzheimer's, they will do a series of cognitive batteries, um, a series of interviews, both with them and then with caregivers or family members. And then all, and then brain imaging, uh, blood workup, and then all of that gets passed to a consensus panel of neurologists and gerontologists. They do a consensus conference and come to a conclusion about what they think that uh, disease state is, because um, you can't actually uh, effectively diagnose Alzheimer's until a person has died. And then if they had symptoms and you find amyloid beta plaques, then that's positive evidence that that individual did die of Alzheimer's or with Alzheimer's disease. Well, we have low levels of, all, of atherosclerosis among the Chimane, so we're likely to have low levels of vascular dementia. Um, but pathogens um, uh, also play a potential role in the development of Alzheimer's type dementia, which could create a situation where Chimane are at slightly higher risk. So there's a group at Harvard uh, led by uh, Rudy Tanzi and the late Robert Moore, and um, they actually started making the argument that amyloid beta may be part of the brain's immune system. They said, why would evolution preserve amyloid beta plaques if they're simply just toxic byproducts? And what they realized was that the um, uh, amyloid beta, because it's really similar in structure to a very potent antimicrobial, they tried a series of studies where first they put amyloid beta on media, and then they tried growing bacteria on it. And what they found was that um, not only did bacteria grow much more poorly when there was amyloid beta, um, but that uh, when they had uh, these uh, bacteria radiolabeled, they actually found that amyloid beta plaques were forming around the, um, uh, these bacteria. So I said, okay, okay, well, what if it's part of the brain's immune system? Um, how should we look at this further? So they ground up um, uh, uh, control brains and Alzheimer's brains, as one does. And then they looked at how bacteria grew on those brains. And what they found was that first, control brains um, grew more bacteria than non-control, than the uh, Alzheimer's brains. And then among Alzheimer's cases, uh, the greater the level of amyloid beta um, per milligram, the poorer the growth of the bacteria. So then they took um, a mouse model for Alzheimer's that produces amyloid beta, and they injected radio-labeled pathogens and uh, were able to track those across the blood-brain barrier. And what they found were that um, individual, uh, that uh, the APOE4 uh, mice that produce amyloid beta, not only did they live longer, um, 
uh, and some even survived to the end of five days. But they, um, uh, when they did necropsies, they found that in the brains of those mice, there were amyloid beta plaques that had formed around those radiolabeled pathogens. Because our brain, we want it separated from the rest of our immune system because things like white blood cells do too much collateral damage. And so it's not terribly surprising that our brain should have its own, some, somehow have its own immune system. And they made the case that potentially um, uh, amyloid beta is part of the brain's immune system. But, um, so what does this mean for a population like the Chimane? Well, we don't have access to an MRI, but we do have access to um, a CT scanner. Um, and again, don't worry, this is just to show you that I do have a brain. I'm not breaking um, any IRB or HIPAA. Um, and Shimane do have um, a uh, decrease in brain volume with age, fairly similar to what we see in the US and among the Framingham study. Um, we have not yet completed enough consensus conferences to be able to come up with a population um, epidemiology for Alzheimer's. Um, and unfortunately, that's all on hold as we try and um, uh, put some procedures in place to decrease the potential spread of uh, COVID-19 among the Chimane because uh, population access to hygiene, water, um, and relatively high rates of TB, low access to hospital beds, it would be uh, a very rough situation. Um, so we've obviously shut down all research for now. Um, but once we can resume, uh, one of the next steps go through the rest of the consensus conferences and then figure out what are the actual rates of Alzheimer's in a population like the Chimane. So just to conclude, um, human evolution occurred in a mosaic of environments. And while you can't point to a population like the Chimane and say that they're the perfect exemplar of the evolutionary past, um, because they're not. Humans evolved in a number of different uh, environments, a mosaic of environments. And so we can't point to any one and say that's the perfect exemplar of human past. But we do know that um, sedentary urban life in cities is a novel environment. And unfortunately, because most medical research is conducted in industrialized population, it doesn't really give us that wide range of variation in human health worldwide. So in order to better understand variation in human health and disease and better understand the causes and perhaps some solutions to the key health problems facing the world today, we really need to start looking outside the normal um, urban box that we have been focused on. So thank you all so much. Um, and I hope everybody is well and healthy. Thank you, Ben. Um, I think what we'll do now is let general uh, viewers ask questions and then we will shift to the discussion period with the class. Sounds good. I do have one question, Ben. Um, just yeah. from your experience being uh, in Bolivia with Chimane, do you sense that there's a lot of Alzheimer's there? Um, so it's a, I guess part of the thing is that uh, we'll really want both a prevalence phase and an incidence phase. So in the US, we have all sorts of social support networks. So if I started to show signs of dementia, then you know, my sister would take me uh, in to get treatment. And if I wandered off after that, there'd be a silver alert and all sorts of other things like that. One of the things, if I'm a 70-year-old Chimane guy and I need to go hunting if I want to have meat on the table, then it could well be that I just don't come back from hunting one day. And then that gets reported as an accidental death or I got killed by jaguars. And that's just what the expectation is. So I think that it'll be really critical to have both a prevalence phase to what's the current prevalence in the population. And then as people are aging in over a five-year period, um, do we see uh, additional cases? Because uh, just a lack of cases now could mean that individuals died from another cause or a cause actually related to Alzheimer's, like getting lost in the forest. Um, certainly we do see cognitive decline with age. Um, and there are definitely 
there are going to be cases, well, I know that there are cases of Alzheimer's, um, but what proportion of individuals have Alzheimer's in this population? I think that's what um, uh, I want a bit more data before I make any uh, definitive statements. But it does exist in the population. Any other questions from the general audience? Ah, we do have one on the chat. Oh, um. uh, so it's, I think it's not that, um, that uh, they are, I think that Shimano Do you want to read the question spike. just so everybody knows? Oh, yes, sorry. Um, the question is, uh, what is the reason for the large early spike in testosterone levels in industrialized nations? And what I would say there is that um, if Chimane grew up in the U.S., we would see the exact same spike in testosterone among Chimane, just because they, uh, if they were living here in the U.S., they wouldn't be exposed to as many parasites and pathogens. They'd have as much food availability as they wanted and they would um, uh, show essentially the exact same spike. Um, because we have uh, access to it when we're sick, um, access to uh, um, high quality foods, all those and low levels of physical activity, all those things allow us to invest a lot of energy into testosterone. Um, whereas among other populations, because they have these other stressors like food availability, uh, parasites and pathogens, uh, high levels of physical activity, all those factors make it so they can't espouse the same um, overall uh, high levels at a young age. That said, uh, one of the first thing, one of the first studies I did with Shimane was um, uh, a uh, soccer tournament. So I took saliva samples before and after the soccer tournament. And you actually see that uh, individuals with, uh, or that, um, Shimane guys uh, show the exact same percent spike in testosterone during a soccer game. So in the US, we see about a 30% on average or 36% on average spike in testosterone when guys engage in some kind of uh, uh, physical activity, um, in particular uh, like judo or soccer or football. All those things cause about a 30% spike in testosterone. Um, Shimane have much lower levels of testosterone to begin with, but actually showed the same percentage increase in testosterone during a soccer game. 